to my uh, countrymen, the uh, Southern Command area of responsibility comprises the uh, islands of Mindanao, Basilan, Sulu, Tawi-Tawi, and Kamigan. It is the uh, Mindanao especially is the second largest island in the country. And it is here that we have what we call the so-called Mindanao country. The Southern Command was uh, organized with the main objective of restoring peace and order and that of accelerating socio-economic development. In our analysis of the situation in Southern Philippines, we found out that the root cause of all this trouble was economic. The economic problem that has plagued Southern Philippines for several centuries. And because of this finding, the government's trust has been towards the resolution of this economic problem, the acceleration of economic development, so as to generate more jobs for our people. We also have tried to counter the propaganda of uh, the enemies of the state, particularly that of the MNLF, the Moro National Liberation Front, headed by its chairman, Nur Miswari, who on several, on several occasions has claimed that there was genocide here in the Philippines, that the Philippine government, particularly its troops, have been killing Muslims. But of course, you and I know that this is not true. Because in truth, we have about 35 Muslims in our armed forces in Southern Philippines. And I'm sure that they would not allow such thing as genocide or such thing as government troops killing Muslims. Another propaganda that Nur Miswari has been uh, telling his benefactors abroad is that we were burning madrasas, we were burning mosques, and that we were trying to Christianize the Muslims in the South. And of course, this is not true, because the truth of the matter is that in the last seven years of martial law, we have built more mosques, more madrasas, than the number of mosques and madrasas that were built in the last 600 years since Islam was first introduced into the Philippines. But Nur Miswari continued with this propaganda of his in order to gain the sympathy and the support of the people in the Middle East. Happily, today, most of these Middle East countries have realized that what Ms. Wari has been telling them were lies, and many of these countries have stopped giving aid to him, and instead have channeled their aid direct to the Philippine government. A good example of this was the donation of uh, $1 million to the Philippine government for the purpose of building or rehabilitating mosques and madrasas in southern Philippines. But as I said earlier, we have found out that the main cause of the trouble in southern Philippines is economics. And the government's trust today is the acceleration of socio-economic development, 
so as to resolve this economic problem. Today, we find all over Mindanao proof of this government's sincerity, government efforts to resolve this economic problem. Every year, about 5 million pesos, 5 billion I should say, is spent here to resolve the economic problems of this part of our country. If you will go around Mindanao today, you will see concrete roads all over the islands. You will be able to see a lot of uh, infrastructure projects like irrigation dams, bridges, piers that have been built all over southern Philippines. We have had everybody, government agencies, involved in economic development. So much so that we have been able to convince the rebels who are fighting the government in the hills to come back to the faults of the law. Because now they see that the government is helping them, that the government will try its best to provide them a means of livelihood. Today, around 40,000 of the former rebels have returned to the faults of the law. And most of them have been provided a means of livelihood. There are about 10,000 more left in the hills. And each of these 10,000 would want to come out if only we could provide them a means of livelihood. Our government, your government, is trying its best to provide this means of livelihood so as to be able to attract to the faults below the remaining rebels that are still in the hills. As a result of the coming out of this 40,000 to the faults of the law, there is relative peace in southern Philippines. We would like to ask you, your help, by accelerating development here in Mindanao, by investing your money in Mindanao, by helping put up firms here so as to generate more jobs for our people. This will surely ensure the coming of peace sooner than we expect. We also have realized that among the problems of our people, which have made them vulnerable to propaganda by the MNLEP, is the poor or low educational uh, attainment of the people here as a result of this economic uh, dislocation. Today, we have been able to put up vocational schools all over the region. The schools that would train not only rebel returnees, but also out-of-school youth and people out of job. Give them a skill so that they will be qualified for work. This is the main problem of many of our rebel returnees. They normally do not, do, do not know anything except to fight, except to hold a gun. So one of our cross program is to train them a skill. Today, many of these 40,000 who have come out have been trained a skill. Many of them have joined firms Filipino firms that are now working or doing their jobs in the Middle East. One of the more successful projects that we have been undertaking here in uh, Southern Philippines is our Siemens project. We train about 60 to 100 seamen every quarter. We train them for three months. 
and the next two months we put them aboard local vessels for their apprenticeship. I say this is the most successful program of the government here is because most of the 500 seamen that we have trained have been placed aboard foreign vessels all over the world and have been sending their dollar earnings to their families regularly. At the beginning, these seamen were afraid to be trained because of propaganda that when they go aboard ship, they will be pushed overboard and will be forgotten just to uh, drown in the sea. But later on, when these seamen who were placed aboard merchant vessels they started sending their dollars earnings back to their families here in the Philippines, our seamen's school was uh, deluded with young boys who wanted to be seamen. Today I have the satisfaction of receiving every day a good number of postcards from our rebel returnees who have turned seamen from all over the world. In fact, uh, just recently I re received a postcard from one of them who visited the country of Aruba. I have never been to Aruba. I don't know where it is. But here is a seaman who have visited that island, of, uh, the country of Aruba. The most that I know about Aruba is the uh, Miss Aruba candidate that they had during the last Miss Universe contest that was held here in the Philippines. Another project that we have undertaken here, in addition to our educational project, is the promotion of the Islamic culture. This year, the president authorized the celebration of the sixth centennial of Islam in our country. For your information, the first Arab missionaries, a missionary I should say, set foot on Philippine soil in 1380 in the person of Sheikh Makdum. He landed on the island of Simono and built the first mosques on that island in, 19, in 1380. This year, 1980, we celebrated a year-long celebration of the sixth centennial of Islam. We had an international convention that was uh, held at the Philippine International Convention Center in Manila sometime uh, earlier this year. And last month, we held the culminating rites of the sixth centennial celebration on the island of Simono, where we were supposed to have no less than the president and the first lady as the guests of the people of Simono. On that day, we uh, inaugurated projects on the island of Simono worth about 5 million pesos. We inaugurated a causeway, we inaugurated a pier, we inaugurated a uh, circumferential road around the island of Simono. We inaugurated a water system. But one thing that we are very proud of inaugurating was the inauguration of an electrical system that was powered by solar power. We were most proud to show to our people who came to uh, as our guests during the sixth centennial celebration that on the island of Simonol, we already already had electricity powered by solar power. Also on that date was the first time that a large Navy ship was able to dock at the pier of Tubig Indangan in Simono. The people were very happy about it because this was the first time in centuries that such a large ship was able to come alongside a pier in Simono. We have many other projects that we feel would accelerate economic development that would generate more jobs and thereby bring 
peace to our country, particularly the southern Philippines. We take advantage also of the fact that we have a lot of natural resources here. As I've always told our foreigner guests who come to visit with us, that we have an abundance of fish. In fact, our fish in our region die of old age, waiting for people to catch them. Today, as a result of uh, prodding from the government, we, are, we have established at least two cunning uh, factories or firms, fish canning that is, in the city of Sambuanga. And uh, the fishermen can now fish as long as as many times as they want in the day because they are assured of a market for our fish. In the past, although we have plenty of fish in, our, uh, in the seas around our region, our fishermen did not find it worthwhile to catch this fish because they had nowhere to sell this, this fish to. Today, with the presence of these two large scanning factories right here in the city of Zambaga, the fishermen have an assured market for their catch. On uh, agriculture, our people have engaged in rubber planting, have engaged in the planting of uh, Ipili pill trees. Since uh, we have a large tract of land that are not being cultivated and which are just waiting for our people to use. Today, our people are starting to export ipil ipil. Today, our people are starting to export other agricultural products as a result of the government's effort to encourage people to plant more. One of the successful efforts of the government in the region is that of our electrification program. I think in Luzon and the Visayas, people pay about a peso for their electricity per kilowatt hour, I would say. But in Mindanao, by 1981, the whole of Mindanao shall have been uh, electrified so much so that cheap power will be available to the people. The present rate of uh, electricity, which uh, we get from the Maria Cristina Falls or the Agos River, is about 30 pesos, uh, 30 centavos per kilowatt hour as compared to about one peso that we pay for electricity we get from a regular uh, uh, generating uh, electricity. For Sambuanga city itself, we have been promised that uh, the Agos grid or the Maria Cristina grid will be here in the middle of next year. And the people of the region, particularly of Sambuanga Peninsula, are happy about it. Because together with the arrival of uh, cheap electricity will also be our export processing efforts. There is a plan to put up an export processing zone in several areas in Mindanao. In Sabuanga City, it is supposed to be established about six or seven kilometers from the city in Mampang. And I understand the Bataan export processing zone head will uh, soon come will be coming in January to start uh, bulldozing the area so that by the middle of next year, when cheap electricity shall have arrived in Sambuanga City, we will be able to implement the plans of putting up an export 
processing zone in the area. Another uh, prospect is that of a coal, coal I should say, coal-fired cement plant in the area. As you know, most, if not all, of our cement, cement factory in the country are fueled by diesel fuel or bunker fuel. Very costly. In fact, 50% uh, of the cost of cement is the cost of fuel. With the uh, availability of uh, coal in Malangas, in the area, with the availability of limestone, we expect to be able to put up a large cement factory in the region. This will add about 5,000 jobs, in addition to the 5,000 jobs which this export processing zone will generate for our people in the area. One of our most successful projects is our health projects. We are uh, the only region in the country, Region 9, I'm talking of Region 9, where we have a region-wide barefoot doctor program. We have been able to train at least 100 barefoot doctors, which we have distributed all over the region to help in uh, giving our people medical care, health services. The other project that I feel that uh, has helped us in uh, our medical and health uh, program in the region is our incentive pay for our doctors and for our nurses. Nowhere in the country do doctors receive more than what we pay our doctors and nurses. And that's the reason why today we have enough nurses. Although in the number of doctors, it seems that uh, the incentive pay has not been able to attract the number that we hoped would be attracted by it. But nevertheless, because of this 50%, and in some cases, 100% increase in the pay of doctors, we have been able to at least retain the doctors that are working in our area. The other uh, successful projects on the line of health services is our uh, success in attracting foreign uh, medical missions to come to our region. And I'm specifically referring to the Guam Medical Mission that has visited our region every year. In fact, this Guam, Guam Medical Mission is headed by my brother, Dr. Spaldon, who is also a senator in the Guam legislature. Every year, he comes to Mindanao, particularly, particularly to Western Mindanao, and with a large group of specialists go all over the region to give free medical health services to our people. This year, this medical mission from Guam came twice, once in July, and the last one was last month in November. They had to come in November because the commissioner for or the commission for Islamic affair saw it fit to award this mission a uh, an award for distinguished service to our people medical service that is by coming to the Philippines every year in the last seven years and have given free medical and health services to our people. The last time they were here, last month, in the two weeks' time that they were here, they were able to operate on 102 cases for free. And if you go out to the barangays in the region, the first question that they'll ask you 
is when is the Guam medical mission coming back? And I'm, I've told my, my brother that uh, even though I will no longer be here as Southcom commander, the Guam medical mission should continue. Another uh, project which uh, I feel we have been successful is the project in our experiment of a new form of government. And I'm referring to the autonomous government that we have organized in regions 9 and 12. In this autonomous government, we have a legislative body composed of 21 members and an executive council composed of five headed by a chairman. These autonomous regions legislate their own laws, provided that they do not conflict, conflict with the national law. I have observed that this experiment in government is succeeding, and I am almost certain that the other regions of our country would want to adopt a similar form of government for their region. There is more participation by the people and more power to the Legislative Assembly and to the Executive Council. This uh, autonomous government was born out of the provisions, or our implementation, I should say, of the provisions of the Triple Agreement, whereby our Muslim brothers made it known that they would want to have some sort of an autonomous arrangement for their government in the South. And the President, in compliance with the Triple Agreement, has allowed the establishment of these two autonomous regions in the South, which, as I said earlier, is a successful one, and which I'm sure the other regions in the country would want to adopt in the future. Yes. My countrymen, I feel that the most successful project that we have or we are undertaking in the South and which has brought about relative peace to the area is our implementation of what you may have heard of, our policy of attraction or our policy of peaceful reconciliation. Because we feel that our brother, the Muslims in the South are our brothers, we feel that the only policy that would succeed here would be the policy of attraction. I remember when I was first sent here to Mindanao in 1973 by the President. And before I came, I passed by Malacanang and reported to the President and asked him for further instructions. And the President said, Admiral, may I see your orders? And when he read the orders that I received from my general headquarters, he remarked that there was something missing in my orders. So in his own handwriting, he added an instruction in that order of mine. And this handwritten instruction ran something like this. And you shall proceed to Mindanao and as much as possible resolve any problem peacefully. To me, this was the order to me. To me, this was the basis of our policy of attraction. I go around a lot uh, to visit our troops in the field, and invariably one of the questions that they would ask of me would be, Sir, 
Ano ba itong ibig sabihin ng policy of attraction? And I would tell them in a very simple explanation what the policy of attraction was all about. I tell them, if you are about to do something and you would want to know whether what you are about to do would come within the purview of the policy of attraction, we ask our boys to ask themselves two questions. This thing that you're about to do, would it make the, the people who will be affected feel that they are Filipinos? And the second question is this, is this thing that you're about to do, would it make the people affected feel that you, the soldiers, are their protectors? And if the answer to these two questions are in the affirmative, we tell our boys to go ahead with what they intended to do for their well within the purview of the policy of attraction. And I would want to conclude that this policy has been a very successful one because today, as I said much earlier, 40,000 of our former rebels have returned to the falls of the law as a result of this palace attraction. Many of them who are still left in the hills would want to come out. On one condition, that when they come out, they could be provided a means of livelihood. And this is where, my friends, you, my countrymen, could help could help bring peace sooner to Mindanao. And that is by coming over, if you want to, and investing your money in Mindanao. Put up a firm here, put up some industries, so as to generate more jobs. For indeed, what we need here in Mindanao are more jobs for our people. I would like also to inform you of what our soldiers are doing here for their country. Most of the things that you learn about are the abuses that a few of them are committing, but is somehow attributed to the whole armed forces organization. But there are only a few black ships in the armed forces. And these are the people we are looking for, because when they are identified, we would like to kick them out of the service so that they could no longer discredit the armed forces or bring down the name of the, the good name, I should say, of the armed forces. But I would like to tell you about a very to me, significant incident. When I was invited to be a guest speaker in one of the cities in Luzon. And I remember when I arrived that city and I arrived the place where I was supposed to speak, I was greeted by cold reception from the people that were present there. I didn't realize what was the cause of this cold reception that I got from them. And yet I was invited as the guest speaker of that, for that occasion. It was only after my speech and after, uh, during the question and answer session that I realized why this cold attitude towards me when one of them stood up and said to me, accusingly, Admiral, why did you allow General Bautista to be killed? Who was responsible for his killing? What have you done? What have you done about it? Very evidently, the people were mad about it. But it was also evident that they didn't know the background of the happening. 
So I told them, my friends, if there was anybody to blame for the massacre, for the killing of General Bautista, it was I, because I was his immediate superior at the time of the unfortunate incident. But I told him, I told them, I should say, that what General Bautista did that day is what we in the armed forces are doing every day. We take risks. We take risks every day. And I'm referring to the officers and men of the armed forces out there in Mindanao. Happily for us, about 95% of these risks that we take every day succeed. Only 5% fail. And this includes the risk that General Bautista took that day. But I would like to tell you of a risk that we took, which to me was one of the most significant event in the conflict of Mindanao. Because to me, it was the turning point of the conflict in Mindanao. And this was an event that occurred in October of 1973. That was when the MNLF was at the height of its power. And we received information that more than 2,000 rebels wanted to come out to the falls of the law. That was on the island of Holo. And the agreement was that these 2,000 rebels would be brought to the shore from the hills. I was supposed to board a ship, anchor it about 500 yards from the shore. And the rebel commanders, eight of them, would come aboard ship where these surrender ceremonies were supposed to be held. On that appointed date, I boarded the ship, went to Holo, anchored about a thousand yards away from the shore, and waited for the commanders to come to the ship where the ceremonies would be held. It was already noontime that day, and yet nobody came aboard ship. Not one of the eight commanders. Happily, after lunchtime, a small pump boat came alongside the ship with a lone person. And the person happened to be, I think you know him by now, Commander Maas Bawa. He came aboard ship and he said, I'd like to talk to Commodore Spaldon. I was a Commodore then in 1973. And when I saw him, he said, in the dialect, in the Taosug dialect, he said, Sir, our 20,000 followers who are now lined up along the shore is making one request from you. And I asked him, what is that request? And he said, they would want you to come ashore to accept their surrender personally. Of course, that was not the agreement. The agreement was a surrender ceremony aboard ship. But on that day, when I got that information that they wanted me ashore, I said the same thing General Bautista said. I remember when General Bautista, Bautista was informed that Usman Sali wanted the meeting at the marketplace instead of at his CP or command post. General Bautista said, let's go. And that morning, or that noontime, or that afternoon in October of 1973, when I was informed that the rebels wanted me ashore to accept personally their surrender, I said the same thing. Let's go. So we went with one pump boat, eight men of us. We went ashore. So as we neared the beach, of course, we were all apprehensive. We were expecting the worst to happen. 
And when the boat, the pump boat, struck land, the rebels who were lined up on the shore rushed us for a while, for a moment. We didn't know what was going to happen. But suddenly, they were swarming over us, embracing us, kissing us, shouting, saying that the government is sincere, that the government is not afraid of the rebels. This was the turning point of the conflict in Mindanao. Because after these 2,000 that came out, many more thousands came out later. So much so that today, about 40,000 of them have returned to the folds of the law. Every time I look back, I think back of this incident, I shudder thinking of what would have happened had I not taken that risk, the same risk that General Bautista took. My countrymen, I would like to close by saying that so long as we will have men in your armed forces that are not afraid to risk, that are not afraid to die, so long will we have a free Philippines. Thank you very much.